Good morning. Thank you for agreeing to do this with My me. My pleasure. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit today about how you got into advertising and okay. and marketing and things of that nature because you're very successful. Thank you're you. a big success story. Um, so what is your current job title and role? Now I'm a professor at St. John's University in Queens and I'm also the director of the public relations program in the Division of Mass Communication. Okay, so um, how did you get into the academic end of it? How did you become a professor of communications as opposed to just working in it? Right. So I spent probably nearly 30 years uh, in various functions within the world of marketing and communications. I worked on the agency side. I worked for different brands. I was uh, I sort of you know, rose the ranks over time. And as part of my responsibilities, I often, if a college wanted a case study on the brand I was working on or a local high school was doing a project, I would often be the one selected to go into the school and present. Why is that? And because I, I really love presenting and I was very passionate about marketing. I like dealing with kids. Um, and one day while I was doing that presentation out at uh, a college in Philadelphia, I had this experience where I said, you know what, I think I'd really rather be doing this than sitting behind my desk all day. And from that moment on, I sort of planted the seed that I would love to um, maybe be an adjunct instructor so I could get my feet wet, because I still loved what I did, I still needed a paycheck. Um, but slowly but surely, I changed that balance and I went from a, an adjunct instructor to a lecturer to an assistant professor, and I went from a corporate uh, guy, if you will, and now I'm uh, consulting. So I still have the best okay. of both worlds. So you're consulting in the corporate world, yes. Um, but mostly what your your main job title is, is um, yes. professor. Well, I need to stay current because there's so much changing in the world of communications. It's not just evolving; it's a revolution. Uh, yep. with what online media has done, what social media has done, has completely changed the way brands, entities, celebrities, politicians talk to consumers. So I need to be on top of that. And what are, what are your thoughts on social media marketing, email marketing, and, and things of that nature? How is that different than when you started 30 years ago? It's very different because now you need to be personal, you need to be relevant. A consumer can turn you off. When we were growing up, you were watching television, no one walked away when the commercials came on. The family sat around, you sat around waiting for the content program to come back. Now with DVRs and, and watching uh, television on other media, so you're watching it on Hulu, you can pause it, you can do whatever you want. So I need to make it relevant so I can gain your attention, I can capture your mind. Because before you were sort of, uh, you know, you were, you were an audience that couldn't go anywhere anyway. Now you can do a million other things. So you no longer have a captive audience in front of the, the boob tube every night. Exactly. It's, not people shut off the commercials yeah. now. Yeah. They pause, they shut off, they go to the they bathroom, they get something to eat, they fast forward, they're talking to their friend, they're on their laptop. So they're busy, they are, you know, they're, they're really splintered. So, I mean, when it comes down to marketing 101, such as sending out a postcard or a mailing or knocking on a door and introducing yourself, how much relevance does that have today, still? It still has relevance. I think, I think the traditional tools still play a role, but they need to be augmented and very much in unison with what's going on online. Uh, but I, and I still think some of those traditional materials, particularly if you have an older audience, and even though that's being to change as well, sometimes having a hard copy. To this day, I would much rather read the hard copy of a newspaper mm -hmm. as opposed to the online version mm -hmm. because I run into things that I probably wouldn't normally read because mm -hmm. I'm just sort of flipping through and looking for interesting things. Um, yeah, and but there's think, something to the physical aspect of yes. it as well. Um, something tangible might have more of an impression on a certain audience. Absolutely. It could you know, pop off the page, it, you know, it, it, whatever. Um, so I think it's still very important. I also think that it's important to sort of customize the communication a little bit. Okay. That you need to really show that I, you, as the advertiser or the communicator, know something about the target audience. Yeah, the audience is obviously, that's uh, the first rule in writing is know your audience, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. So corporate communications, um, how much do you think corporate communications has to do with a creative kind of visual branding individual as opposed to someone who is an excellent writer academically? Okay. I think that they're both important uh, and I think that everyone needs to be creative. In the, in the world of marketing and advertising and communications there's thought to be a creative side, sort of an account side or the management side. I think that even if you're on the management side you need to be a creative thinker. No one can get away anymore by just writing call reports or doing spreadsheets or, or that kind of thing. You need to be a creative strategic thinker and a creative problem solver. So I think that both Left brain, right brain, they both need to be fully functioning. 
To be um, a successful marketer. To be a successful marketer, but probably most important, you need to put you, you need to empathize. You need to put your feet in the shoes of your target audience, so that you can understand the world, the brand from their point of view. What was your favorite brand that you worked for? Snapple. So what was your role at Snapple? Snapple, I had several different roles, but ultimately I was the, uh, the vice president of marketing resources. Uh, one of my claims to fame was I was part of the team that put together the Snapple Real Facts under the cap. Um, and again, that was just about understanding the consumer. There was this ritual when you open a Snapple, shake, you pop the bottom to break that vacuum seal, and you'd pop open the top. And most people just automatically ended up looking at the cap. So why not put something on it? So we said, let's let's take advantage of that real estate. There's, there's something to that. Let's not have it too self-serving. So we just tried this as an idea, and it took off like gangbusters, and we ended up putting it on the website. We did the Snapple Day calendar. We licensed it, uh, and we had a lot of fun with it. And okay. by the way, all the facts were meant to be true. Were meant to be true. Right. There's a rumor out there. I get it asked by my students all the time. Isn't there a Snapple fact that says, you know, in fact, not all the Snapple caps are true. They're all meant to be true. While I was there, and it's been several years, three were disproven. Okay. And we had some fun with that as well, um, but they're all meant to be true. Uh, so what happened to the Snapple brand after the Snapple cap facts came into play? Well, Snapple at the time was this very sort of young, entrepreneurial, creatively driven company, and then we were bought by a bigger conglomerate, a uh, you know a true beverage manufacturer. You know, Dr Pepper had about 30, 40, maybe 50 brands of uh, beverages around the globe, and it just changed. Not that it's it's just different. It's not worse. Uh, I don't think it's better necessarily, but it just changed. Different corporate styles, different management, different brands got priority. Uh, but Snapple, you know, right here all the time. So it started off as really an entrepreneurial thing that just kind of got lucky and grew. And right, it grew like much, wildfire. It became very yeah. attractive to a suitor. That's great. So do you think that the job market for someone who's interested in marketing and advertising is oversaturated with kids who have liberal arts degrees no. or communications degrees? I, I think there are a lot of kids that have all those kinds of degrees, Okay. but I don't think the market is oversaturated with kids that present themselves well as emerging professionals. You can get a thousand resumes for a job, you know almost instantly that, that the large handful that really went above and beyond, they expressed themselves well, they learned something about the company, they presented who they are in a non-traditional fashion or with some creative flair. Really? Such a, can you give me an example of that? So, you know, now uh, I, I teach all my students that they should have an e-portfolio. So the resume does one job. It maybe gets you the interview, but walking in with an e-portfolio, sharing an e-portfolio, uh, engaging with social media about the brand, learning about the brand. So coming in with some understanding. don't need to be an expert. I don't expect you to be, but I expect you to have done a little bit of work to be prepared for the interview and ready to go. Sure, and an e-portfolio, what would be in an e-portfolio? Graphic design work, blogs? Well, people automatically think it has, to, well, it has to be pretty, it has to be graphic design. No, it's just a really nice way to present your materials. It could be a, a paper that you worked on that you're proud of. It could be some design work, absolutely. Uh, it would include your resume. It could include samples of homeworks that you've done that you did well on. Maybe you created a media plan. There's lots of different things that could be in there. Something that represents your personal passions and hobbies in an interesting way about music, about uh, fashion, about sports, about whatever it is that sort of gets you going, but something that dimensionalizes you as an individual. Oh, that's a great idea. So when you're teaching your students, how much of it is, is theory-based versus practical? Because of my years of experience in the field, I tend to be more real-world based and more experiential, but I build on theory and best practices sort of as our foundation. But as I'm highlighting examples and bringing that material to life, it's all about things that are going on in the marketplace today. Very cool. Um, okay, I think that pretty much sums it up, and I appreciate your time. Sure. I know the public does want to know what is the best stuff on earth. <laughs> Listen, I, I, I just can't. I could not divulge the best stuff on earth, but believe me, it is. It is the best stuff. Okay, good to know. Okay, thank you.